Hello, everyone, and welcome to Risk. I am Lee, and today I have a special guest, John Titus. I'm very excited to have this conversation with him. I know we've spoken in the past. I'm a great admirer of you and, and your work, and uh, I just want to say welcome to Risk. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Lee. Good to see you again. No, oh, good to see you as well. So, John, you've done so much work around the Federal Reserve, uh, especially CBDC and, and what's going on and what their plans are. Why, why don't you give a summary of what brought you to this and what's on your mind currently? Well, yeah. So the, the thing that really kind of got the ball rolling with the Fed, this, this, what I'll call this iteration, the, the, the bailouts is one thing. The bailouts of 2009, 2010, that didn't sit well, but th that, that, that didn't, that sort of came and went. Um, and there were no inflationary implications of, of, the QE back then, but this go around with the pandemic, with the, you know, I'll just call it pandemic, uh, which began in terms of the Fed's involvement, involvement in March of 2020. You know that 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 really, when I would look at the numbers of what the Fed was doing, it became immediately apparent to me, in the space of say four weeks back then, that pandemic QE was a different animal than bailout QE, than global financial crisis QE. They were two different things. At the, and at this time, with the pandemic QE, we were going to see huge inflationary implications. And the reason for that was that if you looked at retail bank deposits in the US, which is where the, the heft of money, of what we think of as money, is sitting. Um, if you looked at retail bank accounts, they were tracking basically dollar for dollar, what the Fed was doing in terms of expanding its balance sheet. So for instance, the Fed added in the space of say six or seven weeks, it added $3 trillion to its balance sheet, meaning it, it created $3 trillion of reserves and took on $3 trillion of assets at the very same time in parallel and coterminously, meaning in, in, in at the same time as retail bank accounts went from Thirteen and a half trillion to seven trillion trillion dollars. They dollar for dollar. So ba basically, they, in the past, when when the Fed would promote stimulus or whatever, that that would basically go to the, the the banks, and it wouldn't go into the retail bank accounts, which are just everyday person yeah. bank accounts. Correct? Yes, everyday person bank accounts or retail bank accounts. You have a retail bank account. And I have a retail bank. None we, none of us. If you don't have an account at the Fed, you have a retail banking account. Okay, it's that simple. We transact in retail money that's created and sourced in commercial banks. That's how money is created in our tier of the system. And back in 2009, in that version of QE, yeah, the Fed was creating reserves, but it was spending those reserves. It was buying assets from banks. And banks don't use retail bank money. They use wholesale bank money. They use reserves. They don't, they don't have a, they have accounts at the Fed and that's how they transact the business, okay? So all the money creation back then in the global financial crisis, it didn't create, it didn't really have any effect, the negligible effect on the retail banks, the bank money circuit, you know, retail bank accounts. But in 2020, that changed. And, and so you would look at the creation of new reserves and there's this huge spike up of three and a half trillion dollars. Let's call that the goat. And then you look over at the, at the say the, the, the snake, and you'd see this. You'd see the shape of the goat inside the snake. So, it, the, the snake being the retail bank system, the snake had swallowed those reserves somehow, and it was like, "What? How which, did which that?" Which had never happened, happened before to to when you're studying it, the Fed, it, it, They had they had not done that before no. because the bailout, the the QE during the global financial crisis was really a bailout of the banks, and that is not what happened with pandemic. With pandemic, what the Fed was doing is it was creating new reserves this time. But it was buying assets. It wasn't buying assets from banks. It was buying assets from non-banks. I mean, it was a night and day difference. <clears throat> but because it's buying assets from non-banks, it, it had to pay people. It had to pull off and cause the, you know new bank account money to be created. The Fed was doing was it was buying low-yielding assets, and and you can see this on the Fed's balance sheet. What what expanded during QE during the pandemic? Well, you saw a huge explosion in U.S. Treasuries. 
and you saw a huge explosion in mortgage-backed securities. Oh, so in okay. other words, people were yep. sit, people were sitting on sort of comparatively low-yielding assets, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. The Fed was would take those assets off their hands at par or more than par, and then the people would now have, instead of having a $1,000 treasury on their hands, they'd have $1,000 in their bank account. And they turned around and used that money in the stock market they bought they bought crypto um they bought SPACs, any any number of things but the point is that the fed you know added it, it took the fed by that qe it took the bank supply the bank money supply in bank accounts total bank accounts if you add up everybody's bank account back then it started at 13 and a half trillion and it went to like 17 and a half trillion dollars you don't think there's gonna be inflation for that and the fed is <laughs> pretending like well we, we didn't you know well, well they, they, they sure play inflation. the game in the media don't they and they know exactly what they're doing they're unbelievable they they are they are effing shameless about <laughs> totally. what they do they're like oh well you know, people are getting paid too much uh there's not enough supply never mind we shut down their factories yeah. uh the people are greedy they're spending too much money they're blaming everybody except the perpetrator that had two thumbs and it's called the federal reserve yeah of course that's who the problem was well they, i mean they've be basically been doing that since the the great depression yeah well that's 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 an old book in other words you create the problem and you profit from the problem and then you gain more control with your proposed solution well, of course yeah. they do it again and again and again they yep. just space it out long enough so that people forget what they've done before or they die off you know mm -hmm. well we, we but that's we what they've done and and, and and it's all headed toward you know, it's more and more control for the fed it's more and more leverage they've got more and more leverage over the banks and they're now they're now their big thing is they're slowly pushing away pushing ahead toward central bank digital currency they they want and to be the bank right right now with two tiers of the monetary system you have you know roughly 4500 banks every one of which is creating new money when 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 they lend right so if you come in and get a thousand dollar loan your bank creates that money out of thin air so you have 4500 of these money creators in the u.s called commercial banks that's in one tier in the in the wholesale tier you have the fed and there's 12 there's 12 feds there's the regional federal reserves mm -hmm. federal reserve bank in new york of richmond you know so on and so forth there's 12 of them and so if you go from a system of 12 in one tier to 4500 in a second tier and you replace it with a CBDC system, you no longer have the 4,500 tier, you have the 12 tier. It's really one, because it's the, the New York Fed. When we talk about the Fed, yeah, there's 12 regional Federal Reserve, but there's, there's really only one. It, the, the New York Fed is the only permanent member of the Federal Open Market Committee. They are the only ones with Bloomberg trading terminals. They set policy, you know, they're the boss, okay. you know. Yeah, they're, they're running. Who they're controls running. them? Do you have the other favorite? 11, well, the latest information we have on the, we, in, in theory, the commercial banks in the district of the Fed own that bank, own, the, own that Federal Reserve Bank. So if you look at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, it would be like Citigroup and JP Morgan. Yeah, sure. You know, the bank's headquartered in New York and in, in Connecticut and a couple other places. You know, that's, that, that's how that system would nominally work if you looked at the law. Those banks own the Fed. Okay, but but here's what you don't know. You don't know a couple of things. You don't know how many shares those banks have. Okay. And you don't know who owns the banks. Right? You don't know. So for example, Citigroup. I'm gonna I'm I use a Citigroup. I'll tell you why in a minute. But if you went to to Citigroup's, you know, SEC filings <clears throat> to their 10K and you look at their proxy statement, their proxy statement looks about like everybody else's proxy statement. One of the things they have in the proxy statement is a list of beneficial owners of the company. Mm -hmm. And pretty much every major company in the U.S., you see the same names. It's at BlackRock, it's Vanguard, you know, it's Fidelity, it's, you know, there's a handful of names. Who owns those? Uh, go to their proxy statements and, you know, it's the onion. You never get to the bottom of it. Now, as far as how many shares... We actually know that the, the federal, the New York Fed actually responded a few years ago, meaning within the last 10 years, to a Freedom of Information Act request where supposedly, I haven't seen the documents, supposedly, though, according to writers, they coughed up the ownership, you know, by the banks. And the biggest owner of the New York Fed 
believe it or not, was Citigroup. Okay. I, I was kind of surprised by that in, in one sense. In another sense, I wasn't surprised because Citigroup has a deep, deep history that's you know, way beyond the scope of this interview. Sure. But that's, that's what we know. So we in the bottom line is we don't really know who the people are. We don't really know where the better, where the true owners are located. The people, we kind of know that Citigroup is a dominant player, but that's not really that that's surprising. Not They're one of the, it doesn't tell you anything. Cause yeah, you know, it's, it's complete obfusc- dealers. obfuscation of every, everything. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so that said, what, yeah. what do you think is next for the fed? What's been going on since the, pandemic bailouts if you will in 2020 well they okay so there's a couple of things going on. one thing is quantitative tightening is going on there's no doubt the balance sheet is, is shrinking and there's no doubt interest rates are going up so the big question there is like well you know if you look at the the, the treasuries basically their budget they're the treasury's out of runway I mean, there are a lot of items there, there are four or five major items on the treasury's they say balance sheet that are, are non-negotiable. One one is interest on the debt. Okay, you have thirty three, you have thirty two, whatever it is, thirty trillion dollars of debt. You now your interest payment is small if, since you contracted those debts when interest rates are zero, but that's changed now, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. So if you have short term debt, that's now at a higher interest rate. So one non-negotiable thing on the treasury balance sheet is 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 interest on the debt. You have to make your interest payment. That's non-negotiable. And politically non-negotiable is also like Social Security payments, Medicare, Medicaid. You know, you're not unless there's no politician in his right mind who's going to get to a microphone and say, hey, we're cutting your benefits in half. In fact, I talked to a guy today and he's like, my Social Security payment just went up by 100 bucks. You know, uh, I, went from I, know, I know a couple of people to- on Social Security and they mentioned that to me and like yeah. it was a good thing, but they don't really understand that that's. Not a good thing. Well, <laughs> because that means there's well, inflation it's, everywhere. It's, it's adding it's adding to the debt, and so the dynamic with with the Fed quantitative tightening, you know, interest rates are are going up, and so every every new every the, the new debt issuance, it's all at a higher rate now. So there comes a point, you know. Obviously, let's say you have a house, and if you just calculated the interest payment on the house, and it came out to a thousand dollar a month you know that you have to make your mortgage payment has to be at least a thousand dollars right because if it is it's less than a thousand your debt's gonna exponentiate and get out of control and that's kind of where the treasury is right now if you look at those four big things social security medicare medicaid and, and interest they're they're basically equal to tax revenue and and and, if, and the treasury has said listen we're kind of we're running out of runway we're coming to the point of no return where we're going to have to make some hard choices. But of course, one of the choices they never say is, well, maybe maybe we should stop borrowing the money into existence. What do you think <laughs> about that? Especially since you're borrowing the money into existence now at a higher rate, you're slitting your own throat. They, they sure love to spend our money, don't they? And, and put us a deeper and deeper in debt. They love to create money out of thin air, which is not really money. It's creating debt out of thin air. Yeah. Right? They're, it's not really money. It's, an, you know, money doesn't have a counterparty, right? It, it, you know, Think about that. You know, your money is in your hands. It's good. There's, there's the notion of balance sheet money. That's a banker's trick. And they got everybody thinking that money in your bank account is real money. And it really isn't. If you're outside of your bank, for example, and you have a thousand dollars in cash, that's your money. But if you go inside that bank and deposit, you're no longer own that money. No, you basically made a loan to the bank, right? You're, you're a creditor of the bank now. Yep. That's and not, that's, thing- that's not money. That's a dangerous place to you be, know, isn't it? In today's day and age, it's, it's we've got a thirty trillion dollar debt to 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 prove as much. Yeah, that's a dangerous do, place do, to do be. Do you foresee bail-ins coming to this country? Yes, absolutely. That's that's for sure. That's coming, and that's part of CBDC. Because if you think about it from the bank's point of view, you know, if your money in your bank to go back to go back to my thousand dollar example, that's a liability to the bank, right? Mm-hmm. And you, so the bank is all too happy. The bank didn't want to steal that money. The bank wants to delete that money, right? And that's what bail-ins are. They delete your money. And and so there have been papers floated. That's at the retail level. On the wholesale level, what we're talking about with the treasury debt and whatever else, bail-ins work perfectly if you think about it. You got too much debt. You got inflation's out of control. I got an idea. Just delete half everybody's money, right? 
that'd bring your inflation under control. <laughs> you know, if you don't think that's coming, you're you're out of your mind. That's for sure coming. No, do, do, you, do you think we're going to undergo extreme inflation that's going to cause that? Or do you see something else unfolding right now with the way things have been going? I don't know, Lee. You know, I, I look at I look at Fed data um, and, and what I'm seeing now is just like what is something big is, is coming down the pike. Let me back up. I started making videos back during the pandemic saying, look, you know, people are telling you reserves don't affect the retail money supply. I'm here to tell you they don't know what they're talking about that in, in the pandemic by buying assets from non-banks, they're directly adding money to the money supply. Those reserves are being replicated on a one for one basis in retail bank accounts. OK, so I was on this yihad. I kept making videos saying this, saying this. And, you know, finally, the Fed came out with a paper saying, yeah, <laughs> well, our new Q QE during the pandemic, it creates bank deposits. The Fed admitted that in June of this year. They, came out with a paper. I almost fell out of my chair when I read it. <laughs> okay. No, I'm serious. They, they, they found, uh, you know, you know, the, these people will tell you exactly what they're doing. They will. <laughs> may, may they, take a yeah, paper, after I made, you. yeah, I made three or four videos and then they come out and say, Oh yeah, that's, that's right. You're right. And then, you know, but anyway, they, they almost do so, it braggadociously, you know, like, like look at we, what we did. <laughs> yeah, there is, there is a bit of, um, I don't know, delight in, in some of the, some of the criminality, but, that is that that paper was sort of an academic paper anyway be that as it may what i'm getting at is if you look at retail bank deposits uh, up until up until about 2010 if if you just if you just if you had to have one number to know what retail bank deposit how much retail bank deposits were in the system and you couldn't you didn't have access to the retail deposit number itself the next best thing would have been to know tell me how many loans banks have made? What's their loan volume? It was a very close approximation, meaning within 5%. So from 1913 till about 2010, bank deposits were essentially equal to bank lending. Okay. It was like an equation because, you know, when banks lend, they create money out of thin air. That's how mm -hmm. money gets created in our system. That relationship broke during quantitative easing a little bit, and it really broke during pandemic QE. Okay. And the new equation kind of became, well, bank deposits equal bank loans, retail bank loans, plus QE, you know, new liabilities created by the, by the Fed, new reserves, okay? That relationship now, I'm telling you, is beginning to break down. And if you, and if you look at, and it's off by, it's off by about $3 trillion, which to me is like, well, where, where is that coming from? In other words, if you look at bank deposits, right, they're sitting at about $18 trillion right now, right? Bank loans are sitting at, you know, I don't know, 11. And the reserves are sitting at, say, three, three and a half. Does this mean people Those are not buying houses, et cetera? I don't, Lee, I don't know what it means. I, 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 every, every time I come up with a theory for like, well, where... Where are these, where's this $3 trillion in bank deposits coming from? It's not coming from loans. It's not coming from new QE. They're tightening the balance sheet for one thing. Where is this money coming from? And I don't know the answer to it. And it's, a, it's not, it, it gets, a, it, the, 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 the signal, that graph becomes bigger every day. It's just like, well, something's going on. That's why I say, I think something big is coming, coming because that money is coming from somewhere. But where, I don't know. I, so I, I don't, I'm kind of lost in the feds in all this data. And I don't see anybody, I don't see anybody talking about like, well, it, and it's definitely, it's linked to what I'm talking, what I'm talking about is to interest rates. Okay. If you, if you, if you track interest rates, especially the, the, the current interest rate, like the cumulative interest rate, it, it's, it's, it's monitored, it's mirroring this creation of new bank money. And I, I just don't know where it's coming from. But I don't see anybody talking about it. It's like, well, the, you know, and I don't see anybody talking about, well, you can't just, you can't just slap on a 10% interest rate out of nowhere with a debt of $30 trillion. Who, you know, who's going to pay for that? How are you going to make your interest payment? I mean, right now it's not such a big problem because most of the debt was contracted, like I say, back in the day when you, the interest rates were basically zero. But you have a lot of short-term debt on the balance sheet, right? I mean, not all of it's 30 years. There's a lot of 10 years. There's a lot of five year, you know, a lot of one year. On the, so you so that once that debt rolls, 
and you've got to you got to swap out say a half percent loan and you now you now need a new whatever a new trillion dollars and you got to borrow it at three and a half or four percent yeah your big, juice big payment difference. is getting big yeah big big difference. Yeah, huge difference yeah. yeah i mean it's you know you, you know two years ago or a year ago if you looked at the interest payment on the debt it's sitting and i forget it, it on the order of 500 billion dollars but that's what the interest rates at a quarter a point or half a point what happens when they're four and five and six percent and more and more and more and the fed is showing no sign none of backing off the interest rate increases right i mean they they ham and they haw and they say this but they keep it increasing the rate and so what i'm saying is the fed sort of played dumb when they did the pandemic qe they're like oh gosh you know where did that inflation come from <laughs> you know i no, i'm serious they were like oh it must be oh, i remember i remember and, well <laughs> just like why don't you why don't you just blame you know blame sunspots your excuses are ridiculous you know where it came from yeah, you just created four and a half trillion dollars you know damn well where it came from mervyn king who it, used to be it's the this, it's this game he, he did it <laughs> yeah no it's this game it's you you dirty consumer you're <laughs> greedy you agree you're working too many hours you're taking too you know you're buying too many tech you're spending too much money there's no end to their excuses but mervyn king the former governor of the bank of england threw the fed under the bus in an interview he said, well, it's obvious where the inflation came from. The Fed printed the money that bought assets from non-banks and it created new retail bank money. That's where the inflation came from. That's why you have 25% inflation. Do, do you have any insight as to what's on the Fed's balance sheet? Because, I mean, I know they, they hold things a lot, a lot of things off balance sheet. Do you have any insight into that at all? What, on the off balance sheet? The I assets, no yeah. Do off balance sheet. yeah. Yeah, if you look at the assets, um, you know, it's mostly the, 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 the bit, the heft of it is just u.s treasuries right but but all the off-balance off holdings I, I guess are just completely black box I, I don't really know how that game works and I, where would it be reported you know i, I just don't know I, I look at their balance sheet i'm confused enough by their balance sheet trying to figure out like you know <laughs> this business like you know what, what's going on there you know I'm, I'm not a financial guy by training you know i'm a lawyer and i've got a you know my thing is like it takes me time to find sources like oh okay that's what that is you know it took me a long time to figure out well, why are why are coins on the asset side of the balance sheet and cash on the liability side i didn't get that for a while but i track it down and a year later okay you know so i have enough on my plate trying to figure out what's what's on their balance sheet right, I understand. and what it means treasuries you know obviously treasuries are going to be more and more in their balance sheet with debt yeah, right? of course. because the treasury has to issue all this debt and the fed's got to take it on because i don't think there's going to be many buyers out there god forbid there's a crash because then you're you know, it, it'll happen i, I don't think it's going to happen yet but it, it will definitely happen by the end of two, 2023 that's something's that's coming opinion. yeah i i actually something's i think we're, we're about to have a, a pretty good rally for uh at least a month or so but you know that's that's speculation yeah that's pretty that's pretty pretty bold i i don't have a sense for that but i can look at what the fed's doing and, and you know and it, it, i guess the thing that astonishes me the most is is the just the lying of like oh we didn't know where inflation came from it's like you you what, what do you mean you what you okay you are so full of it you, you know that after the global financial crisis the banks needed to be a bailout and you bought their assets from the banks you bought their treasuries and you bought their mortgage backed securities. Okay. In pandemic QE 2020, you didn't buy from the banks. You bought from non banks. You know that the people you were buying from, you know they don't have accounts with you. Okay. So don't pretend that you didn't know the, the, the banks that they, that this retail money had to be ginned up. But, but they, that's exactly what the Fed, you have fear, you have the chairman of the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury Secretary. You have Janet Yellen. And Jerome Powell sitting there with a straight face, pretending that they don't understand where inflation comes from. The lying, and, and you just, know what? In, just, the, in that position, I, not knowing that, they should be immediately removed from those positions. <laughs> they, they, they do know it. Of course, they, they do. For admitting that, absolutely. Yeah, they yeah. should. Yeah, they should be right. Take him at their word and fire him for incompetence. I see what you mean. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Right. I, okay, I'll take. I'll take you at face. Here's your choice, Powell and Yellen. Either you're going, you're going to jail for perjury, because we know that you know where the inflation came from, or you're such an idiot, such an untrained clown, that you just you see yourself to the door exactly. for incompetence. Exactly, you know? and we know 
we know that this is all one big game. We, we know that the politicians are in on it as well. I mean, they're, they're, they're all in the same club. Yeah. But so, I, I don't, I don't, I, we're, I, to me, we've come to the end of, we've come to the end of the U.S. chapter of the debt-based monetary system. The U.S. is done, right? <clears throat> that there's no more, you, you can't have a situation where you're borrowing to make your interest payment. And that's where we are. You're yeah, the, borrowing the, the, money. The petrodollar you know, system is utterly under collapse, and we're seeing it first. It's, the U.S. is like a degenerate gambler. It's borrowing money to make its interest payment. It's, when, when you understand kind of the, the, non, the non-negotiable payments, it's interest payments plus Social Security plus Medicare and Medicaid. You're borrowing your money to to make your, your the nut you need to make every month. You have to borrow it. There's no room left in the budget for anything else and you're borrowing all of that. Well, well, both right? you and I know the, the end game is CBDC. It's probably going to be a global CBDC yep. to control yep. everything that you do. So, you know, yep. when, when you in have that words, end game in mind, everything just kind of like unfolds. Like, this is why they're doing it. The classic way when you have a sovereign that's at the end of its rope like the U.S. is, the classic way to try to w- wriggle your way out of that is to print money. The theory being, you know, I'll, I'll I'll pay off the debt tomorrow with less valuable money, right? That's that's the classic way to do it, but that doesn't work because it's going to create massive inflation. So, I, and I'm convinced that people have figured out in upper echelons, hey, you know what? We could we could we could get that game, we could keep that game going for a while, if we had a way where we could delete part of the money supply. Okay. We could, so we could create all the money we want on the one hand, and on the other hand, come in and say, you know what, your carbon footprint's too big. Uh, you know what? Yeah, you said the wrong thing about those, you know, LGBTIQ characters on Disney. Your social credit court. We're deleting some of your money. You know, I, I'm convinced that that's part of the the plan. Well, it's like a double edged sword of control. Yeah, you got it. They they control what it's, you buy and they control what you say. Yeah, they they got you coming and they got you going. I mean, yeah. I mean, we've seen in other countries where they basically just delete zeros off their dollars, which is which is somewhat yeah. in effect the same thing, but this is much much Absolutely. more insidious. <laughs> this is much more insidious much because more. it could be targeted. It could, they could target guys like you and me and you know people they don't like, and it's like well you know they get a ninety five percent haircut, and Jamie Dimon. You know, he says all the right things or, you know, Dorsey on Twitter, they say all the right things. They don't get haircuts at all. So it's it, all in the name of financial it. inclusion, isn't it? Don't get me started. <laughs> so financial inclusion for I don't know, viewers who don't know, financial inclusion is one of the buzzwords they're using to roll out CBDC. And they're, so the powers that be are planning to, to roll this out kind of as a welfare thing like hey you know we, we a lot of people a lot of people leave they live under bridges and they live in tunnels and they don't have internet access they don't even have cell phones and so what we we want to include them in our wonderful system the digital systems so they have access to our system and that's that's how they're going to roll out and they're they're upfront about this that's how they're going to roll out cbdc is they're going to supply people who have nothing and they'll say yeah 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 put the microchip right in my fingertip. That's fine. <laughs> Whatever. I'll have it. Because they couldn't just no, give them a the couple hundred it. dollars in bills, right? Oh, no. No, no. That would be. No, you want to, because, and they'll tell you. They'll tell you the reason we can't do that is they'll spend it on the wrong things. You know, we, we need people to spend the money wisely on healthy things. And we can do that with CBDC. It's pro- programmable money. So the one of these homeless guys under the bridge has $100 of CBDC. He can go to the store. But he can't buy Mad Dog Twenty Twenty. Yeah, he has to buy pump. He has to buy pumpkin seeds, or you know whatever it is. You bugs. get the idea. It's gonna be bugs. But yeah, you got <laughs> you got to buy teas and you got if you got to buy ticks and fleas, your ticks and fleas burrito. You can't have the regular burrito. It's not good for you. <laughs> oh, we're laughing about this, but it's really sick and kind of frightening. It's it's so dark where we're headed. It really is. It's really you know, you it's very. It, 
it's it's not it's really not funny because what's ahead is a system of totalitarianism beyond the wildest dreams of the third reich oh absolutely way absolutely. beyond they didn't have well, this, well you know i, I, mean, I think no, china I to some extent has been a, a test bed for this whole system and you know they're they're way ahead of us with the cbdc's and I, yeah it, it 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 it's quite frightening there was way, um, way ahead there was a martial artist in china who had studied mma and he was just completely destroying all the traditional chinese martial arts on youtube and everything else he was just uh -huh. like showing that they just didn't work against like real fighting and boy did his his social credit score went way down and he got uh <laughs> to the point where he couldn't even like get on a bus just just for doing that i mean it that that that's where we're wow headed. yeah yeah exactly right and their officials are pretty upfront about it like hey you know those yellow vest protests in france that wouldn't happen if you had a social credit system in china you control the people yeah you know and it, it, during the pandemic they you know once you got outside your zip code or whatever your money just shut down yeah well we were talking Go before we started recording about like how to get out of the system and, and what to do and, and you alluded to just just using cash for things now i'm of the yeah. opinion that not enough people are going to be do, aware of what's going on and, and do that to make much of an impact. But is there anything else that you can think of that people should do and how they should protect themselves financially? Yeah, get to know, I mean, get to know your neighbors and start bartering. I mean, the, the, the more you engage in transactions and the better you get by doing more of these transactions that are sort of outside the system and outside the, the view of the panopticon, the big brother government is watching us all the time, the better off you'll be. To so get better at doing things that, you know, people can't keep an eye on. You know, don't use that credit card. Don't, don't, you know, go. And I'm, you know, I'm guilty of all these things too. You know, out of convenience, I, you know, go on, order stuff, order something on Amazon because I'll get it the next day. Yeah, you know, I got to train myself and be part of this. Like, hey, you know what? You need a new lens? Go to your local lens guy. You know, save up your cash. You don't need the lens now. Save up cash, go buy it. <clears throat> you know what I mean? It's going to take and a lot really of work way to do, do it. Now, it's going to, it's a ton of work. Yeah. It's a ton of work, but this, you know, you're not going to, you know, no revolution was ever won on conveniently on a couch. This is not how things work. Yeah. It's going to be, a, you know, we're, we're staring at a serious driven and insane and evil enemy. And they're not going to, they're not going to relent until they're done. So yeah, you're, it's going to be a little painful, but spending cash, is not that painful. It's a lot, it's a lot better than the alternative. The, you know the electronic shock around your neck all the time yeah I mean, you want that it's true i mean that's where we're headed yep uh, you, they're going to control you oh you know you can't buy that <laughs> they're, they're whatever you want about no that. you can't buy it they're totally up front about that i see speakers at the bis the bank for international settlements and the imf and they're, they're the, the glee that's that, that it fuses from them when they're talking about the control oh, they, they, they drool over this over they people. really they're, you can see they're it they're drooling it's sick right yeah. they're just like oh man now we know where every penny is spent you know we can turn the money off we have our rules we can implement our rules but they, they're these people want to play god in a big way they just it's basically psychopaths at the yeah. top and that's what we're dealing with so yeah it's going to be a little inconvenient you know bartering and but you know the the, the, the alternative like i say it's coming and it's not good i, I talk to people and <laughs> it's it's crazy it's like talking to kids because they'll, they'll listen and then they say oh where should i invest my money and i say well maybe you know you should be really worried about you know how can you get to your money you know the squirrel can get to his nuts can you can you get to your money that's the first question is are you sure you can access your money number one but on a personal level i would say you know now's the time it's never too late to invest in things that can't be taken from you and there's not a long list it's basically invest in yourself you know acquire new skills learn how to do something i i this christmas for example i i took a bunch of photographs this year people in my family i'm like you know what i'd be nice to frame them and i got into it i realized i had bitten off more than i could chew i was like you know you could you got to learn how to frame and i did i you know i bought the equipment about the, the cutters and the, the board and the tape and all this stuff it was involved but I, you know i got a new skill now i'm confident that i can now frame pictures not that well, but well enough. I mean, no one knows the difference. No one, you know, in my family. 
but it's a skill like and i, I love doing that and getting skills like that because no one can take it away from you once you get it Very it true. goes in it doesn't come back out you know, you know? It's, it's funny you say That's, that because i i was a paper boy when i was a little kid and i used to talk to my customers because I, I just liked to, and some of them were older and one woman said sure. to me when i was a kid you have to learn as much as you can because it's the only thing in life that people can't take away from you. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're saying yep. now. Yeah. That's that's a that's a that's one of the most compelling reasons to get educated to to go to college because no one can take that degree from you. You know, they can take the paper. Right. Right, but they can't they can't take the they can't take the achievement away from you. You know, and those are the kinds of things it's the same thing with skill acquisition. You know, in middle age you get these skills and they can't, they can't you know they come in handy. You'd be surprised you know i sat down it took me a long time to learn how to make videos but i learned you know i fit you know I, I overcame i also overcame the fear of failure which is a big thing like i was so terrified of falling on my face all the time and by failing 500 times in a row it became like yeah who cares no one's watching anyway what do i care and that's you know? how you learn and you anyway. learn and you get better at stuff absolutely that's how you learn right so that's you know that's a more of a personal you know opinion than a financial opinion but you know, the, the, here's the thing with the financial system. You know, ultimately, we've got a system. We've been talking about this. The, 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 the liars and criminals are running the system, and trust is hard to come by. You know, and the whole system of money and everything else depends on trusting, and especially in a debt-based monetary system. It all comes down to somewhere at some point, you got to trust your counterparties. And if you can't trust your counterparties, it says that system's done. You know, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. And when that time is, that time is probably here now, if we were really honest about it, you know, I used to have a friend, he was a, he was a bond trader or he was a, I think a, he was in the grain room at um, the CB of Chicago board of trade. And he would tell me, he'd say, well, if you beat the house, you know, meaning the, the financial system, the wall street or whatever, they'll change your rules on you. They'll just change. And I said, you're full of it. You know, they won't do that. And he was right in retrospect. Well, he was exactly right. Yeah. yeah they'll change the rules on you. And so, you know, but it's getting worse. The problem, the lying and the reveling in the lying and the openness of the lying, like, ah, I'm lying. What are you going to do about it? It's really out in the open and we're headed into a, a dark place as a result of that. And without that, without that trust, you really, you know, you're worrying about your money in your bank account. That's, that's, that should be the last thing on your mind beyond your access to it. You know, I, I had interviewed because this, um I had interviewed someone from Lebanon about last year, Ali Jihadi, I think was his name. And he basically was living through the government and the banks just shutting off access to all your money. Yeah. So it's happened before. Right. It's not like without precedent. So, I, I mean, I, it's obviously, happened in the I've US, they, they, it happened in, they outlawed, they outlawed, gold was money up until 1933, right? It was legal tender. And they just, with the flick of a pen, said, no, we, we criminalized the ownership of that form of money. You could no longer, they had posted treasury officials at the banks so that when you went to your safe deposit the box, if there was gold in there, they just took it and they gave you, they gave you $20 and then they promptly turned around and rate, you know, made it $35. So, so it's, a, it's a good idea not to keep too much gold and silver in your safety deposit box. You kind of have to yeah, hide it somewhere. If, it, if, it, if you don't have it, I mean, gold and silver, you know, if, if you got it, I mean, then you have to have it. That's the whole appeal of it is you don't have a counterparty. And if things, you know, push comes to shove, you know, you can melt it down, you know, melt your gold bars down in a, in the golf clubs and go on vacation and no one's the wiser. You got your money with you. You'd have it with you though. I, I, I yeah, once knew a guy I worked don't with, leave it he, in. he actually fled South Africa and to get his money out of the country, he actually sewed diamonds into his clothes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot of ways to roll. Believe me. <laughs> Now the melting point of gold is pretty high. You know, it's hard to melt. Yeah, you kind of have to know what you're easy. doing to smelt gold. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's tough, but you know, you, the the point is, in a system without trust, in a system without the rule of law, which is where we are, in a system Absolutely. run by criminals, you know, the whole monetary system it rests on, you know, the equal it's, enforcement of law. Oh yeah, and it's not equal. Uh, you know, and uh, as you're saying that. Uh, We've come to a point where there are more and more people becoming aware of what's going on, and it, it, it's kind of been exponential the past couple yeah. of years. So the curtain's it kind really of coming has. down on the whole game as they're accelerating it to a point where I think is just breathtaking. 
Yeah. Yeah. What gets me when I talk to people is that is the, you know, you know, I, I love the U S I'll never move out of the U S I mean, even though I think maybe I should move to Costa Rica or whatever, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. But I love this country and I love talking to people because of the verb, the, the, the number of flavors of distrust of the system is just awesome. You know, people have different reasons, different bogeymen, but the, the one unifying thing is the trust is vanishing. And you know, the quickly. sands are coming out of the hourglass, flying out, mm -hmm. flying out. Very you know? quickly. And there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different mythology around, you know, what's going on, but it's all, it's, you know, we're run by people who are up to no good. Yeah, yeah and I think that's becoming more and more obvious <laughs> on so yeah. many levels. It's, it's not just like one little area. It's like everything is at one time. It, it, it's really a, a breathtaking thing to watch. Yeah. So when I meet people who, you know, their reasons for distrusting the system are way different from mine. You know, I, for a while I would get hung up on like, well, that's not right. You know, that's kind of crazy, whatever. Forget that. Find areas where you agree and roll with that yeah absolutely that's, that's absolutely. where you that's where you need to be focusing you know because you're going to need these people and, and divide and conquer is an ancient it's an ancient ancient strategy oh and, and boy have they, they been doing that for, to us for decades uh, the, the media the, everything. The only, the, yeah the only relevant question you really have to ask you know a brother in arms is do you have an account at the fed if no that's your ally <laughs> Right. Okay. Pretty <laughs> I easy. Guess that's that's a good point. You know. That's yeah. Funny. And there are a lot of us, and not many of them. A, a, yeah. a lot, lot more of us. They, yeah. They yeah. they are truly like the point oh one percent of the world. So. Yeah. You know, I, it's it's a good thing because you know during the bailouts, I would tell people, you know, I, I kind of saw what was going on. It was, it was sort of the, the veil got ripped away from me, and I was like, what the what's going on here? And I would tell people, you know, th this is unbelievable. You know, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., the great jurist from the 20th century in the U.S., said, you know, even a dog knows the difference between being tripped over and being kicked. And a lot of people are getting kicked to death, and they don't know it, right? They refuse to admit it. And now I think we've kind of passed that Patty Hearst syndrome, and people are like, yeah, we're getting b abused out in the open. People well, you, you know, you, you, you and grow that's up a good in, positive in the country and, and you want to love the country. And I, I certainly do. I, you'll never find me anywhere else. I mean, I absolutely love this country. I love our history. I, I love what, what our original um, documents stood for and what people fought for for, for many you know centuries now. But right. we're not right. living in that world. I mean, it's, it's all an illusion. I, no. I believe that it's been an illusion since you know, World War One and World War Two, when we were basically shifted from national sovereignty to more of like global governments through yeah. United Nations yeah. and other organizations. And I think right. people are slowly waking up to that reality that we're not really the country that we thought we were. And it's been an illusion for us. Yeah, to me, one of the most dangerous developments along those lines is it's really the open um, derogation of the rule of law and saying, no, no, do you, you know, for a long time, even if people were breaking the law, they they kind of try to pretend that they were equally enforcing the law. They were kind of they would at least go through the motions of pretending they're right. Oh, now, now it's in your about, face, well, like they're above the law. Yep. You got it. No, absolutely. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. That's where, where, the, where the principle of the rule of law is what's being pissed on now. You know, and you're, you're an attorney, so practice. you probably appreciate that more than anyone else. I mean, do you have any insight as to where you think the whole Sam Bankman Freed thing is is going to go? Do you think he'll get a slap on the wrist or get Epstein? I, 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 yeah, I think he'll, 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 I, yeah, he'll get Epstein, which to me means he'll vanish somewhere. Um, he, he, the whole thing, to me, there's too many questions that have that haven't been answered in that. Um, the whole story is kind of ludicrous. The notion that this one kid could pull off all these things is ridiculous. He had a thousand people. It's sort of like, I think Bernie Madoff in a lot of ways was a test case. Because you remember Bernie Madoff, and it's like, you're telling me one guy did all this? It's, that's impossible. You know, Bernie Madoff, I don't know if you know this, but you know his company never placed a trade, right? Never placed a trade. Wow. Right? Now, if you think thing. about that, yeah, never placed a trade. The best reading on 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 Bernie Madoff to me is that there's a few pages in a book 
by Charles Ferguson called Predator Nation. There's a chapter maybe on, on just read it. That chapter will open your eyes. But he, the guy never placed a trade. And so it's like, well, okay, well, that makes it easy, doesn't it? No, it makes it really hard. Because if you think about it, no paper if, trail. if you've got a thousand, if you've got a thousand, no, there was a paper trail. Okay. He, 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 had to, he had to gin the whole paper trail up, literally. He mailed all of the stuff. Okay, so let's say I'm here in Raleigh, North Carolina, got my money with Uncle Bernie, got a thousand shares of IBM. I tell him, hey, Bernie, reinvest the dividends. Okay. And so I know the next quarter I'm going to have, instead of a thousand shares, I'm going to have whatever it is. You know how it goes, a thousand and three point six seven six, right? Mm -hmm. He's got to do that. He's got to do that for for one person times the number of shares they have times the number of customers he's got total. You think Bernie did that by himself? It's physically <laughs> impossible. Physically impossible to keep track of all that. There's no Even if way. he was Einstein, he couldn't have done it. He had to have had a team of at least 500 people. And that was, to me, that was a great fiction of Bernie Madoff is like the notion that this one guy was running this empire, this Ponzi scheme by himself was preposterous. So there should have been 500 to 1,000 people in jail, but they got away with it. Now we got Sang Bank McFried and the same thing. It's like this one kid did all this stuff. Really? You're telling me, that you, okay, you know how much money a billion dollars is? I mean, just in terms of the physical size of a billion dollars and a hundred dollar bills, you couldn't carry it around. It's too much, right? It's like 22, uh, it's, I don't know, 2,200 pounds or something. It's a lot of weight. My point is that these empires that he would build, they're way too complicated. He had to have had a massive team behind him doing this stuff. It's like, where, plus the whole thing is like, where, where did you, where did the initial money come from? How are you getting on stage with Bill Clinton and Tony Blair? Who's backing you? How are you pulling this off? You're sitting there playing these video games all day. Meanwhile, there's a, factory full of elves churning away ginning up all these companies and doing and routing this money around you can't just route money around like that no. willy-nilly no you no. can't just you can't just wire i'm sorry you can't just wire a billion dollars you got to clear a lot of hurdles to get that done who's doing this who's behind this guy how did how did sullivan or cromwell even get appointed in this case where did that happen you know so i've been tracking this that, 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 a that's a bit. big white white shoe law firm right yeah, big big time. They're around, and they've been historically around for a long time. Yeah. Among other things, they represented HSBC in the money laundering case. Anyway, they're they're they are an old line law firm, uh, Manhattan firm. They've been around forever. Anyway, they represent all any sort of funny money happens connected with the CIA, connected with big banks. Solomon Cromwell's, you know, they're in the game. The they're within spitting. No. They're within spitting distance, whether you could see them or not. They're around, okay. And now they're down there, mixed up, and they're knee deep in this this Sam Bankman Free. They're the main, uh, you know, creditor's attorney, right? And so, I don't know. There's there's a ton of stuff going on. To me, the timing of it is like you're telling me this wasn't an orchestrated takedown of crypto and of of, of Bitcoin, because it seems like it was to me. It seems like. But, well, all, sort all you have setting. to do is look at Sam Bank from Freed's mother and what, what she does for a living. I'll just leave that, yeah, you're, leave you're that hint out there for everyone. It, it's too perfect a setup to bring in, to introduce CBDC as the white knight in shining armor to take care of all the problems created by this miscreant, right? I, I, I just don't. I, I, there's too many unanswered questions in that case. And it's not just, unan it's not just that unanswered questions. That, no one's even asking the questions. Of course not. You know, right. yeah, because it, it's it's a huge empire here. It's a lot of money that, that went missing. I mean, the whole it, the Dan it, it's Friedberg, inconceivable you know? amounts of money. You you just can't comprehend how much money is gone from that. It's it's what not happened like to a, the story of the day, the day after the bankruptcy, people's crypto wallets get drained off the exchange. That that just vanished down the memory hole. What about the fact that this guy's chief compliance officer was Dan Friedberg? Who was mixed up in the ultimate bets scandal where ultimate bets had the god mode on its poker tables it was fleecing players at its own tables because they knew what their cards were wow. dan friedberg was behind that and it was the chief he was the he was the gc of ftx the general counsel the chief compliance officer there where is he in all this where where's he vanished to so it's like yeah this this the the aroma coming off this story is just it's very very powerful um and very manufactured 
w- wouldn't it be nice to get into the books of that company and just see where money went and who was involved? Yeah, the books and and the and the phone logs. Yeah, that would, yeah. More more but, than but uh, the paper. You know, the the paper trail. Um, the complexity of this is not to be believed. I mean, the Lehman Bank bankruptcy, you know, and I was at the law firm that did the Lehman bankruptcy. I didn't, to be clear, did not work on that. That was General Block. It was, the, the, it was done by a guy named Tony Velucas, who had a team of like 40 attorneys working around the clock. That was the biggest bankruptcy at the time. But the org chart of the Lehman brothers, you know, the most complicated bankruptcy ever, is dwarfed by the org chart of FTX and its associated companies. It's unbelievable. That's why I mean, it's like, I saw what had to be, I saw what had to be done firsthand just to do the Lehman bankruptcy, a team of like 40, 45 attorneys working around the clock all the time on that bankruptcy. I can only imagine what had to be done to pull off all the different transactions and corporate shells. And now they see them, now they don't companies in FTX. There's a huge team there somewhere. No one's even talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, and and they will all disappear into the woodwork. So you know, if you, the the too long didn't read version of that story is, what's the takeaway from what? What am I to surmise? You know, what narrative is, is am I being fed with the F, FTX story? Because it's it's a, the whole thing is manufactured, right? Oh, it's, absolutely. It's just, you have no a doubt factory of people back, back there. Yeah, there's there's a there's an invisible army of people that produced that gave us this financial production. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so the question is, well, what, what message are they sending? You know, and I think the message ultimately is going to be, you know, CBDC is being set up as Mighty Mouse. Here he comes to save the day. It's CBDC well is big. clean. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's speculation on my part. You know, I, but I, I don't have the time or the inclination to, to get in a wheeze. No, you FDX know what, J- John, out. that would take a team of probably 100 forensic accountants and as many attorneys yeah. to go through everything. Yeah, I mean, I went on my Pacer account and took a look at the docket and poked through some of the more interesting looking affidavits. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's too much. There's there's too much. You go in and look at this, you know, the 17 aff- aff- 17 page affidavit, and then there's all oh, there's a 71 page attachment A and the 82 page. It's too much. Way too much. So, Sullivan Cromwell yeah. will be having many billable hours over this whole thing, won't they be? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. Yeah. yeah, they got a team and they're good. I mean, you know, I listen, you know, I download, you know, the, the PDFs that have audio files with them. I listen to the hearings. There's a hearing coming up in January. It's, it's what's called the second day hearing. I'll probably listen to that. I listened to the first hearing. It was two hours. You know, it, it, it's interesting, but it's super time consuming. I, I just don't have the time for it. Well, I'm sure. Sure. Well, on that note, John, I, I really want to thank you for coming. It's been just an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, I look forward to speaking to you again in the future. And uh, is, there, is there anything you'd like to say before we wrap it up completely? Yeah, we talked earlier about um, a guy, Alfred Owen Crozier. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. The guy who wrote US, U.S. corporate currency versus U.S. money versus corporate currency in 1912. This guy was a ferocious critic of the Fed. He gave us the, the drawing of the octopus wrapping around everything in 1912. And now, 110 years later, here we are. An octopus is wrapped around everything. Oh, absolutely. Crozier writes he, a fantastic. Was- he was a prophet. He really was. Yeah, it's a it's a fantastic critique of really the personalities behind the Fed and what they were up to and their dirty tactics. It's a good read, but you know, it's hard to kind of hard to find. Anyway, I'm sure. All right, John. Thank you so much. Have a happy New Year. All right, Lee. Thanks for having me. I'll see you again.